Well, welcome back. This session is going to be devoted to pulmonary blood flow, which, if you like, is the third link in the chain of the movement of oxygen from the air to the mitochondria. We've already dealt with, the, with ventilation, the movement of air into the alveoli, to the blood gas barrier. We've dealt with diffusion across the blood gas barrier. And now we're going to talk about pulmonary blood flow, which is the means by which the oxygenated blood is moved away from the lung towards the periphery of the body. And in the, at the same time, oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide laden blood uh, comes into the lung for the, ox for the CO2 to be evolved. Now let's start by looking at a comparison of the pulmonary and systemic circulations. The first thing you notice here is that the blood comes from the right ventricle, moves through the pulmonary artery, through the capillaries, and back to the left atrium. And on the systemic side, the blood from the left ventricle exits via the aorta, goes through the systemic capillaries in the periphery of the body, and back to the right atrium. And we can see some of the pressures here indicated on the diagram. The mean pressure in the pulmonary artery is about 15 millimeters of mercury. And notice how very different that is from the pressure, the mean pressure on the systemic side, which is 100, about 100 millimeters of mercury. Then as we go from the pulmonary artery to the capillaries, you notice that quite a bit of the pressure drop occurs, we believe, in the pulmonary capillary bed. And then the pressure in the left atrium is about five millimeters of mercury. On the systemic side, the situation is rather different. The mean aortic pressure is around about 100. And by the time you get to the beginning of the capillaries, a large amount of this pressure is lost. Rather different from the situation here, where the difference in pressure between the pulmonary artery and the start of the capillaries is very small. And the reason for this is that on the systemic side, we've got throttles, if you like. We've got muscular arterioles that constrict and, uh, and increase in their diameter, and they allow the distribution of blood to different parts of the body. For example, if you start running, it's very important that the amount of cardiac output going to the exercising leg muscles increases greatly and, and that's very important on the systemic side. Not so on the pulmonary side. We don't have a great deal of vascular smooth muscle as we'll see in a moment and the uh, uh, pressure drop across the capillaries is the main pressure drop or is part of the large pressure drop on the pulmonary side. Let's look at the vascular resistance of the two circulations. Well, vascular resistance, and we'll talk about this a bit more in a moment, but it's defined as the pressure drop divided by the flow. Now, of course, the flow in the pulmonary and systemic circulations is identical. Those two circulations are in series. But the pressure drop for the pulmonary circulation is what? 15 minus 5, that's about 10. Whereas for the systemic side, you've got 100 minus 2, well, that's close to 100. That means that the vascular resistance on the systemic side is 10 times that on the pulmonary side. So the pulmonary circulation is a low pressure and low resistance circulation. And incidentally, we mentioned the low pressure right at the beginning of this series when we pointed out that the thickness of the wall of the pulmonary arteries is very much less than on the systemic side. And this, of course, is because of the low pressure within them. OK, let's move on now and look at the pressures within the uh, blood vessels. And the first thing we might ask is, what is the pressure within the pulmonary capillaries? Well, we've already seen that that's quite small. Uh, what about the pressure around the pulmonary capillaries? Well, here's a nice electron micrograph. We've seen it a couple of times before already. And we can see that the pulmonary capillaries are sitting in the alveolar wall, and very close to them is the alveolar gas. So if you were asked, 
what pressure the capillaries were exposed to, you might say, well, alveolar pressure, and you would be absolutely right. The capillaries are exposed to alveolar pressure, and in fact, if you raise the alveolar pressure above the capillary pressure, or the same, by the same token, you reduce the capillary pressure below the alveolar pressure, the capillaries are compressed and they collapse. And an example is shown here. This is uh, the same lung, actually, but just under a different situation. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, micrograph is obtained by rapid freezing, and we believe that is a very good way of showing exactly what's happening during life. And you can see that the capillaries have completely collapsed. Hardly find a red blood cell here. Here's one over here, perhaps. But uh, frankly, the capillaries have completely collapsed and they, of course, are bloodless under these conditions. That's not all that surprising when we go back and look at the electron micrograph of a pulmonary capillary. Again, we've seen this several times now. The wall of the pulmonary capillary, the blood gas barrier, is fantastically thin. And so uh, it's not surprising that when we raise the pressure outside the capillary above the pressure inside, then the capillaries simply collapse. Now let's go on to talk about the pressures around the small, uh, uh, the slightly larger blood vessels. And in this case, we're looking at a pulmonary vein. Incidentally, how do I know it's a pulmonary vein? Mainly because it's not accompanied by an airway. Remember we said earlier on that the veins move away from the airways, but the small pulmonary arteries accompany the airways. And that's one way of distinguishing between the two, because actually the wall of the vein and the wall of the artery are actually quite similar. They're not very different, unlike the case in the, in the systemic circulation. And so we know this is a, a, a vein because there's no airway accompanying it. And if somebody says, now, what's the pressure around this small pulmonary blood vessel within the lung parenchyma, it's within the alveolar region of the lung, you may say, well, I think the pressure might be alveolar pressure because, look, the alveoli are closely applied to the outside of the vein. But in fact, the, that is not the case because the alveolar walls are under tension and they're pulling on this small pulmonary vein. So it turns out that the pressure around the small pulmonary veins and small pulmonary arteries is rather less than alveolar pressure. And we often divide the blood vessels in the lung into alveolar vessels, which are mainly the capillaries here exposed to alveolar pressure, and what are rather unimaginably called the extra alveolar vessels, those not exposed to alveolar pressure. Now these extra alveolar vessels contain some smooth muscle and uh, with a little bit of tone perhaps and some elastic tissue and so they have a tendency to become smaller. But they are actively pulled open by the radial traction of the lung parenchyma around them. The alveolar walls are pulling on the extra alveolar vessels and tend to hold them open. So you can think of the caliber of the extra alveolar vessels as, as under dynamic conditions. You've got the expansion of the lung trying to pull them open and you've got their intrinsic natural tendency to get smaller and so that determines the caliber of these vessels. And as you might expect, and as we'll see in a moment, the extra alveolar vessels uh, become larger, their caliber increases, when we increase lung volume. Now we're going to move to vascular resistance. Pulmonary vascular resistance is a very important topic. Uh, we see uh, it's important for many reasons, not just for pure physiological reasons, but because many patients with heart and lung disease have increased pulmonary vascular resistance, so we need to be clear about that. And first of all, what do we mean by resistance? Well, it's defined as the input pressure minus the output pressure divided by the flow. If you've got a pipe shown here with, say, water running through it, the pressure at the upstream end must be greater than the pressure at the downstream end because uh, that is uh, what is responsible for flow. If there's no flow, there's no difference in pressure. But, uh, but if there is, 
flow, there has to be a pressure difference. And so the vascular resistance is defined by the input pressure minus the output pressure divided by the flow. Now you can see that this is basically the same as electrical resistance. Electrical resistance is the input voltage, pressure, minus the output voltage divided by the current or the, the flow. That's the electrical resistance. And so these are comparable. The, the, the uh, definitions are basically the same. However, it turns out that there are very important differences between vascular resistance and electrical resistance. For example, suppose you go to the local uh, radio shack or whatever and you buy a one ohm resistance. Okay, Then if you put one volt across it, you get one amp going through it. If you put 10 volts across it, you get 10 amps going through it. So the, the uh, resistance does not change depending on the upstream or the downstream pressure. Not so with vascular resistance. And here's an example shown here. Now, first of all, I should say that this can be a confusing diagram if you don't remember one thing, and that is we're only going to change one pressure at, the at a time. So let's imagine that we fix the, the pulmonary venous pressure at, say, 20 centimeters of water in this particular instance. These are data, by the way, from a, a, uh, an animal preparation. Fix the venous pressure at, say, 20 centimeters of water. Notice that as we increase arterial pressure from about 20 to towards 40 here, pulmonary vascular resistance falls. So here you have a situation where you keep the downstream pressure constant, you raise the upstream pressure, arterial pressure, and vascular resistance falls. By the same token, we can do a similar thing if we fix the arterial pressure constant. Suppose we fix arterial pressure at, what, 23 or something centimeters of water here, fix that and increase venous pressure. Well, as we increase venous pressure, pulmonary vascular resistance falls. So this is a very different situation from an electrical resistance, which is unaltered whether you change the upstream or downstream pressure or not. What's the reason for this behavior? Well, the answer is that when you increase the arterial or the venous pressure, the other pressure being held constant, you must increase capillary pressure, which is somewhere between them. And when you increase the pressure in the capillaries, you get two things happening. One is you get recruitment of capillaries, which means that capillaries open up and allow flow under normal conditions. They may be closed or possibly they're open with no flow. But when you raise the pr pressure inside them, flow occurs, and that's called recruitment, which is shown here. These unopened vessels open up. And the other thing that happens is called distension. And that is an increase in the caliber of the capillaries, which therefore reduces their vascular resistance. And it's not surprising that this happens because, again, if we look at our electron micrograph, we can see that the wall, of course, is very, very thin. And if you increase the pressure in the capillary, the, the capillary wall ex, ex, distend, the capillary distends rather like a plastic bag distends as you keep the pressure within it. Incidentally, we don't think that there's any stretch in the capillary wall because that's got some very tough tissue in it, which probably does not allow any stretching at all. But it certainly distends. It becomes more circular in cross-section. And that, of course, reduces its, uh, its resistance. Incidentally, a number of years ago, there was a big debate about whether recruitment occurs in the capillaries. And I'm just showing this out of interest. Uh, people then looked at, at the, uh, what happens to the number of open capillaries, shown here, as you raise the perfusing pressure, and they showed that this dramatically increased. So there's no doubt about recruitment. The same thing was true of distension. Uh, in these isolated lung preparations, it was possible to measure the width of the capillary, shown here. And as you raise the capillary pressure, you could see that the mean width increases. So there was no doubt that that occurs. Now, lung volume has an important effect on pulmonary vascular resistance. 
For example, if we reduce lung volume to a low level here, and again, these are data from an animal preparation, if you reduce the lung volume, as shown here, then what happens is that the extra alveolar vessels become smaller in calibre. Uh, we talked about that before. What happens is that the radial traction of the alveolar walls around them is reduced because lung volume is reduced, the tension in the alveolar walls falls, and so the extra alveolar vessels become smaller and vascular resistance rises. It's also true that vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance, increases at high lung volumes. Now, we're not absolutely certain why that occurs, but I think a very good bet is that what is happening here is the capillaries become distorted, and because the tension in the alveolar walls is very high, they become very thin and their vascular resistance increases. And it's rather like taking a piece of very thin-walled rubber tubing, rubber dam tubing, and stretching it across its diameter. It becomes very thin, of course, and that increases its vascular resistance. So that's probably the reason why the vascular resistance increases with lung inflation. And we tend to breathe at the minimal value of vascular resistance, which makes sense. So that if, if lung volume increases greatly above our normal breathing volume, we have a high resistance. If we go down to a very low volume, then resistance increases again. Now let me move from vascular resistance to the measurement of pulmonary blood flow. First, total pulmonary blood flow. And we do this using what's called the Fick principle. Fick, Adolf Fick, was a German physiologist in the 19th century, and he described this principle, which really is simply the conservation of mass. It's like what goes up comes down, that kind of conservation. And what the Fick principle says is that the volume of oxygen, and now here we're using these symbols that we talked about a little bit time ago, just to clarify again, the volume with a dot over it means volume per unit time. So this is the oxygen consumption measured at the mouth. The oxygen consumption measured at the mouth is going to be equal to the amount of oxygen removed by the pulmonary blood flow. Now the amount removed is going to be the difference between the incoming concentration, which the concentration of oxygen in mixed venous blood, that's a lowercase v with a bar over it, that means mixed venous, minus uh, uh, the difference between that and the concentration in the arterial blood. The concentration of oxygen C, lowercase a for arterial oxygen here. Of course, the oxygen concentration here exceeds the concentration there because oxygen is taken up by the lung. So writing this down using Q for blood flow, Q meaning quantity, Q with a dot over it would be blood flow in liters per minute, say. Oxygen consumption is the blood flow times this difference, sometimes called the arterial venous difference, arterial venous oxygen difference, and from that we can rearrange it and get the measurement of blood flow. It's a very important technique for measuring pulmonary blood flow. It's used, for example, in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. Uh, there are a couple of problems with it. The main problem is that in order to measure the concentration of mixed venous blood, we have to have a catheter in the pulmonary artery. And that's uh, not a, an easy thing to do, except if you're in the cardiac catheterization lab. Well, you can do it in the ward, but uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that now. Uh, but that's uh, a minor complication. You can get the concentration in arterial blood by taking a blood sample uh, from an artery, and the measurement in the uh, measurement of oxygen consumption is relatively easy to make. So this is an important method of measuring total blood flow. I'm not going to go into it in any more detail. It falls to some extent in the province of cardiovascular physiology, but this is the principle, a very important principle, and we use it a lot. We use the equation a lot when we're trying to understand what happens to the difference between arterial blood and venous blood under various conditions. There are other ways, by the way, of measuring total pulmonary blood flow using uh, dilution techniques, di-dilution or thermal dilution techniques. I'm not going to go into those, uh, but uh, again, the cardiovascular people will tell you all about those. 
Now let's talk about the distribution of blood flow in the lung. We've talked about the total blood flow, but it turns out that the distribution of blood flow in the normal upright human lung is very uneven. And this shows how this can be, this is one way in which this can be measured. Suppose we take a normal subject and we put him or her in front of a, a bank of radiation counters, and then we dissolve some radioactive xenon, xenon-133. Radioactive xenon is dissolved in saline and injected into a peripheral vein. Then the radioactive xenon finds its way to the pulmonary capillaries. Of course, all the venous blood gets to the lung, finds its way to the pulmonary capillaries, and it's, most of it is evolved into the alveolar gas because it has a low solubility. It's a its partition coefficient uh, requires that most of it is in the gas phase rather than the blood phase. And we ask the subject to hold his breath for 10 or 15 seconds or so. And so we can measure the amount of xenon which reaches different parts of the lung, and that gives us the blood flow. It actually gives us the blood flow per unit volume. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that can also be measured. And what we find, perhaps surprisingly, is that the blood flow near the bottom of the lung, near the base of the lung here, is very high, but it decreases as we go up the lung. And in fact, measurements made, some measurements made, both using radioactive xenon and with other techniques, uh, which give you actually more uh, specific data, more accurate data at the top of the lung, indicate that under normal resting conditions, the, the, the apex of the upright lung in the, in the seated position of a patient is sometimes barely perfused. It's almost no blood flow going to the top of the lung. So that's a very perhaps surprising finding, isn't it? Now we can easily show that this distribution of blood flow is affected by change of posture. For example, if you have a seated subject here, here we've got blood flow on this axis and we've got distance up the lung from the bottom to the top here. In a seated subject, the blood flow near the bottom of the lung greatly exceeds the blood flow near the top, as we saw. But if that subject then lies supine, the blood flows become almost the same. Okay? In fact, it looks as though the apical blood flow is a little bit higher, and that probably is because the inclination of the lung is slightly head down under those conditions. On exercise in the upright position, both the basal blood flow and the apical blood flow increase. And so blood flow becomes more uniform in the sense that the uh, fractional differences down the lung become less. Now it's possible to sort out the factors responsible for the distribution of blood flow using an isolated lung preparation. It's necessary to do that because what we want to do is, is change one pressure at the time. We're dealing with basically three pressures here. We've got the pulmonary artery pressure, the pulmonary venous pressure, and the alveolar pressure, and we want to measure the flow, and it's very difficult, in fact it's impossible, in the intact subject to alter those uh, one by one. So we go to an isolated lung preparation, and here's a, a isolated lung preparation with the normal pulmonary arterial and venous pressures, and you can see that the distribution is essentially the same as that found in the normal subject. High blood flow near the top of the lung, falling to very low values at the top. Now we're, it's easy to change the various pressures and look what happens if we reduce the pulmonary arterial pressure. We keep the venous pressure the same. Incidentally when we do that of course blood flow will decrease because if we keep the downstream pressure constant and we reduce the upstream pressure, arterial pressure, blood flow will decrease. And look at the distribution of blood flow under these conditions. Quite different. Again, well, first of all, we've got blood flow on this axis, distance here from the bottom to the top of the lung. Again, blood flow decreases as we go up the lung. But when we get to a, a certain point in the lung, blood flow falls to zero. So that the lung above this point is unperfused. Isn't that a strange situation? Furthermore, we can predict the level at which this no-flow zone starts by looking at where the arterial and the alveolar pressures are equal. 
that indicates uh, experimentally that corresponds with the level to which the blood rises in the lung. We can also raise the pulmonary venous pressure and you get a pattern often like this where the blood flow in the lower part of the lung before, becomes more uniform but again blood flow tends to fall to zero where the arterial pressure is equal to the alveolar pressure. And we can put all those measurements together in a three zone model of the lung which is shown here. And in this three zone model we're dividing the lung into three zones based on the relations between the arterial pressure, the venous pressure and the alveolar pressure. And the symbols here, the alveolar pressure is a uppercase A, a capital A, arterial pressure is lowercase a, venous pressure a lowercase b. And what you see from this is if you go up the lung far enough, this upright lung, you may reach a point where there, the pulmonary arterial pressure, this one, falls below alveolar pressure. Well now you may say why does the arterial pressure become less than alveolar pressure? Because you can think of the arterial tree as a continuous column of blood. And in a continuous column of liquid there's a hydrostatic gradient. Any scuba diver knows that. If he dives down the pressure increases. So in the column of blood in the arteries there's a hydrostatic pressure gradient. And if you go up high enough the arterial pressure will fall below alveolar pressure. Under these conditions you've got the pressure outside the capillary exceeding the pressure inside and the capillaries collapse as we saw before. And this is just to remind us what this looks like. Here's a situation where the arterial pressure and therefore the capillary pressure is less than the alveolar pressure and we get compression of the capillaries and no flow. So this is a situation called zone one. Now I should emphasize that we don't see a zone one under normal conditions. <laughs> it would make much sense if we walked around with the tops of our lungs unperfused. No we don't. The pulmonary arterial pressure is just sufficient to raise blood to the top of the lung under normal resting conditions. And so we don't see a zone one under normal conditions but we can predict when it would occur for example, if the arterial pressure is reduced, the pulmonary arterial pressure is reduced as a result of hemorrhage. If a patient is involved in a car accident, comes into the hospital with a substantial loss of blood, uh, there is a, a fall in systemic arterial pressure and also in pulmonary arterial pressure and we may see a zone one under those conditions. Again, if we ventilate a patient, particularly that patient, with uh, positive pressure ventilation uh, in the operating room which is usually done we raise the alveolar pressure and of course that's also likely to cause a zone one. Where would the zone one be in a patient who's lying on the operating table in the supine position? Well it's going to be at the top of the lung, the anterior part of the lung because what we're talking about here are uh, gravitational factors. Okay. Now as we come down the lung the pulmonary artery pressure increases because of the hydrostatic effect and we get to a point where the arterial pressure increases, uh, exceeds the venous pressure which of course it always does but in this situation the arterial pressure exceeds the alveolar pressure therefore there's flow but the alveolar pressure exceeds venous pressure. Now this is a very interesting situation. It's called zone two and it turns out that the blood flow through this region of the lung does not depend on arterial minus venous pressure as you might think, this is usually the case, but under these conditions it depends on the arterial minus the alveolar pressure. And the reason is that the capillaries are collapsible and they collapse at the downstream end until the pressure inside them is equal to alveolar pressure and therefore it's this pressure which is determining blood flow. It's the arterial minus the alveolar pressure gradient determining blood flow. And we can model this in outside uh, in the laboratory 
as shown here. Here's a, a model of this situation. It's often called a Starling resistor because it was used by a physiologist called Starling in one of his heart lung preparations, but it goes by other names as well, a waterfall effect or the sluice effect, because in both cases the flow over a waterfall or over a sluice does not depend on the downstream pressure. Uh, so that's, those terms are often used. So what we've got here is a model where you've got uh, some fluid in this case, water or whatever, dye, and you've got two chambers here. The lower chamber, you can see down here, we, in both chambers we have collapsible tubing, okay? And in the lower chamber, the venous pressure exceeds the pressure in the chamber, okay? Under those conditions, the collapsible tubing is held open and the flow of water, of course, will be determined by the upstream pressure minus the downstream pressure, okay? But now look at what happens in chamber A here. In chamber A, the pressure in the compartment here, the, the chamber pressure, is greater than the downstream pressure here. And what we get then, as I said before, is a collapse in the collapsible tube here, the compressible tube, until the pressure inside the tube at this point is equal to chamber pressure and therefore flow is determined by upstream pressure minus chamber pressure. Okay, very interesting situation and occurs in other situations as well. As a matter of fact, we'll come across it again in the airways of the lung a bit later on. So zone two then is a situation where the blood flow is determined by the arterial minus the alveolar pressure. So why does blood flow increase down zone two? Well, arterial pressure is increasing, the hydrostatic effect. Alveolar pressure is the same throughout the lung, okay? And therefore, the pressure difference increases and blood flow increases. Then finally, we get to zone three, where now the arterial pressure has increased even more, and the venous pressure, of course, has also increased because of the hydrostatic gradient in the veins. And now we reach the situation where pulmonary arterial pressure exceeds venous pressure. Of course, it does that everywhere. And venous pressure exceeds alveolar pressure. And now there's no Starling resistor effect. The collapsible tubes, the capillaries are held open and blood flow is determined in the usual way by arterial minus venous pressure. Why does blood flow increase down this region? Well, probably because of recruitment and distension of vessels but the reasons for the increase in blood flow down zone three are not the same as those down zone two. Now, I should emphasize that although gravity has a very important effect on the distribution of blood flow, there are other factors as well, and I'll just mention them briefly. As you might expect, at any particular level in the lung, there are random variations in the geometry of the blood vessels and therefore the resistance of the vessels. And so these cause some uneven blood flow at a particular level. There's also some evidence from animal preparations that in the acinus, the proximal regions, that's the region nearest the heart, the proximal regions of the acinus uh, receive a little bit more blood flow than the distal regions. And in some animal preparations, it's quite clear that some regions of the lung, for reasons that we don't fully understand, seem to have an intrinsically higher vascular resistance. So there are other reasons why the distribution of blood flow uh, tends to be uneven. Now, I've been talking about the, what we might call the passive effects on the pulmonary circulation, the effects of changing lung volume, changing pressures, uh, uh, in different parts, the arterial, the venous, the alveolar pressure, and so on. Those are passive effects, gravitational effects included, which, uh, which are altering the blood flow through the lung. But there are also active influences, and the most important one is shown here, and we're going to talk about that for a bit. And that is the effect on pulmonary blood flow of breathing a low oxygen mixture, uh, high, making the alveoli hypoxic, a low PO2 in the alveolar gas. So here we've got an animal preparation. These are data from an animal preparation where we're measuring the mean pulmonary arterial pressure here, centimeters of water, uh, 
and this is time on this axis. Initially, the animal is given air to breathe with 21% oxygen, okay? And then we turn over rapidly to giving the animal 10% oxygen to breathe. Well, of course, 10% oxygen means that the alveoli have a low uh, PO2. The, the gas in the alveoli is hypoxic. And so uh, the only difference uh, in changing the inspired gas is to make the, the alveoli hypoxic, and this is done over this period of time, what, about five minutes or so? And then we return to air breathing again, and the pulmonary artery pressure returns to zero, to, to the pre-hypoxic pre, uh, period. So here's a very remarkable finding. There's a, there's a rapid and sustained increase in pulmonary artery pressure during the hypoxic period. So what's going on here? Very uh, interesting change taking place. Uh, an increase, and this has got to be an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance because in this preparation the flow rate didn't change and the venous pressure didn't change. So the fact that the pulmonary arterial pressure increased means that there must have been an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. Now we can look at this again in a slightly different preparation. Again, it's an animal preparation where we're looking at the blood flow. In this case, the pulmonary arterial pressure is not changed, but we're looking at the blood flow uh, plotted against the alveolar PO2, which reduces, which falls, as we reduce the inspired PO2 level. Okay, so we start off with a very high alveolar PO2. The normal value is about 100, by the way, and we're going to talk about that in much more detail when we get to gas exchange. So the normal value is round about here. So we're starting with a very high value, which was given uh, by, uh, uh, produced by giving the animal a high concentration of oxygen to breathe. And you can see that there's not much change. There seems to be a bit, but not much change in the blood flow through the lung. And for blood flow, here we can, we can say pulmonary vascular resistance. As the blood flow falls, since the pulmonary arterial pressure has not been altered, the, since the blood flow falls, this means an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. So resistance doesn't change much up here. But notice that when we start to reduce the the alveolar PO2 below 100, particularly when we get down to the 50s, 40s range, 30 or so, big increase in pulmonary vascular resistance caused by this low alveolar PO2. And this phenomenon is called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And it turns out that the wall of the small blood vessels, the small arteries, shown here, here's an example of a small artery, and here's its airway, by the way, alongside it here. The wall of the artery has a small amount of vascular smooth muscle in it, and you can see that it's very, very close to the alveolar gas. So it's not difficult for the wall to be exposed by diffusion but be exposed to the low PO2 in the alveolar gas. And incidentally, we know it's the alveolar gas that's most important for this phenomenon because if we reduce the PO2 in the blood, then the vasoconstriction is much less. It's the, the, uh, the, the gas concentration, the gas PO2 is the most important thing. So the result is that there is diffusion of oxygen and the PO2 in the wall becomes very uh, very low, and this induces a change in the vascular smooth muscle. Now, there's a great deal of research on exactly what's happening, and we're not completely clear yet, at least I'm not, as to the, the, the exact phenomenon. We do know that uh, voltage-gated potassium channels are important in this hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. We know the vasoconstriction can be inhibited by nitric oxide, and there are a number of other features that we know about it, but uh, the exact mechanism is still a subject of intense research. So what would be the reasons for having uh, this vasoconstriction? Well, it's known that in some diseases, this is advantageous. For example, look at this 
uh, cartoon here. Suppose we have a disease like uh, chronic bronchitis, where in one region of the lung, the airway is narrowed, for example, because of uh, swelling of the wall of the airway because of edema or retained secretions in this region. Uh, for some reason, the airway is narrowed. Then I think you can see intuitively that because the blood flow is normal through this region, the PO2 in this region is going to be reduced. The amount of ventilation going to the region is going to be reduced and therefore the PO2 will be lowered. And by the way, we're going to go into that much in much more detail in a, a later session. Anyway, the low PO2 in the alveolar gas then affects the resistance of the supplying arteriole, the small artery supplying this region of the lung. The low PO2 causes vasoconstriction that reduces the blood flow here. So you can see that this is going to inhibit the, going to reduce the deleterious effects of the reduced ventilation of this region. By reducing the amount of blood flow to this region, we're going to reduce the amount of poorly oxygenated blood coming from this uh, region. And we know that occurs to some extent in diseases like chronic bronchitis and asthma, for example. There is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction in those regions of the lung that are poorly ventilated. But I don't think that is the main reason why we have this phenomenon. And I'm going to explain the main reason to you here, and it's a little bit convoluted, so I've actually put it down on the image here. It has to do with the perinatal events. Now, you know, when we're born is a cataclysmic event. We can all congratulate ourselves that we uh, managed to uh, survive that because in a very short period of time, the, the newborn baby goes through a tremendous change in physiology. It turns out that the pulmonary blood flow in the fetus is only about 15% of the cardiac output. Why? Because, of course, the lung is not responsible for gas exchange. Gas exchange is occurring through the placenta. For The only reason for giving blood to the lung is for nutrition and growth and so on. So it only needs about 15% of the cardiac output. Most of the output of the right ventricle, which would normally go to the lung, bypasses the lung through a vessel called the ductus arteriosus that joins the pulmonary artery to the aorta. And because the lung has a very high pulmonary vascular resistance, most of the blood flow bypasses the lung. What's the cause of the very high pulmonary vascular resistance in the fetus? Well, it's mainly because of hypoxic constriction of the very muscular pulmonary arteries. Turns out that the fetus has a great deal of vascular smooth muscle in the, in the small arteries, and uh, it's capable of, of, of uh, uh, raising a high degree of constriction. So that prevents most of the blood from going through the lung. However, at birth, when the baby takes its first breath, dramatic changes take place. First, after a, a few seconds, gas exchange through the placenta becomes unimportant, and now the baby has to, to rely on his lung for gas exchange. So now pulmonary blood flow has to increase dramatically from 15% to most of the cardiac output. And that needs, of course, a dramatic fall in pulmonary vascular resistance. And this comes about mainly because of the release of the hypoxic vasoconstriction. There's also an increase in lung volume, which is thought perhaps to play a role as well. But the most important factor is the release of hypoxic vasoconstriction. Uh, in addition, the ductus arteriosus gradually constricts and uh, tends to reduce the, uh, the amount of blood that can be shunted uh, through the ductus arteriosus. So those are very dramatic events. They're critically important in the survival, in the transition from the fetus to the newborn uh, baby. And uh, in, in, I believe that that is the main evolutionary pressure for the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So finally, I'm going to spend some time on a somewhat different topic, uh, but it's important, and it has to do with the metabolic functions of the lung. Now, these are covered often in pharmacology, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on them, but they're important 
and they remind us that the lung is the only organ of the body, perhaps with the exception of the heart, that receives the whole of the cardiac output. So it's uniquely placed to uh, modify the uh, composition of the blood flowing through it, quite apart from the fact that it oxygenates the blood, of course, and, re and removes some of the carbon dioxide. And there are several headings here in this slide, and I, I thought it would be useful to have an image uh, because it's, it's rather technical, some of this. Uh, so first of all, there are examples of biological activation shown here. And the best example of that is the conversion of angiotensin 1 to the vasoconstrictor angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a powerful vasoconstrictor, and that takes place through the, as a result of the enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is in the uh, surface of the endothelial cells of the vessels. And actually, if you go back and look at the little cartoon that I have at the beginning of this series, of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, session, uh, you'll see that there is an indication of some little blobs on the small pulmonary blood vessels, and that indicates the metabolic uh, activity of the lung. So that's the best example of biological activation. There's also biological inactivation, and the examples here are uh, listed, bradykinin, serotonin, and some prostaglandins as well. And so uh, that's an important uh, metabolic function of the lung, that biological inactivation. Many substances are not affected as they go through the lung, listed here, epinephrine, some of the prostaglandins, angiotensin II, which as we said was formed, and vasopressin. There are examples of substances that are metabolized in the lung and then released into the circulation. They include the products of arachidonic acid metabolism, They're the two branches of that, the leukotrienes and the prostaglandins. And finally, there are substances that are secreted by the lung, and the most important of those are the immunoglobulins, particularly IgA, which is secreted into bronchial mucus and is an important factor in uh, the defense mechanisms of the lung. And we'll go into those later in more detail. So now let me just briefly summarize some of the main uh, points that we've made here. First of all, we compared the, the pulmonary and the systemic circulations. And we pointed out that the pulmonary circulation is a low resistance circulation. Uh, it also has a, a, a very low pressure within it. And that's the reason why the pulmonary blood vessels, the arteries and veins, uh, have uh, very thin walls. We talked about the pressures within the pulmonary blood vessels. Uh, we said that the pressures, we, uh, we indicated that the pressures fall in a gradual way through the pulmonary circulation, unlike the systemic circulation, where there's a dramatic fall at the level of the pulmonary arterioles, uh, which are the throttles that determine where the distribution of systemic blood flow is given. We talked about the pressure outside pulmonary blood vessels, particularly the capillaries, where they are directly exposed to alveolar pressure, so if alveolar pressure exceeds capillary pressure, the capillaries collapse, and that occurs in zone one of the lung. We talked about the pressure around the larger blood vessels, those within the parenchyma, and pointed out that they are exposed to a lower pressure, and particularly important is that when the lung is expanded, these vessels expand with it. And by the way, we'll see that happens to the airways as well. We then, talk about, we then talked about pulmonary vascular resistance, compared it with electrical resistance, and showed that there were big differences. In electrical resistance, the resistance is independent of the upstream and downstream pressures or voltages, not so in the lung, where if you raise, for example, the upstream pressure, the downstream pressure being constant, you raise capillary pressure, vascular resistance is decreased, both because of a distension and recruitment of the capillaries. We also talked about the effects of lung volume on resistance. Vascular resistance increases both at low lung volumes and at abnormally high lung volumes. 
We dwelt very briefly with the measurement of total pulmonary blood flow by the FIC principle, and that principle is very important, as we'll see later on in understanding gas exchange. We then spent some time on the uneven distribution of blood flow, the three-zone model. We talked about the zone one, where the capillaries are collapsed and there is no gas exchange, sometimes known, by the way, as alveolar dead space because there's no gas exchange. And then we talked about the zone two phenomenon, where flow is determined by the arterial minus the alveolar pressure, the Starling resistor effect. And uh, we uh, and also um, talked about the, the zone three. Uh, incidentally, I, what I didn't say, and I, I meant to, is that the three zone model is not the whole story. It's the most important part of the story. I didn't go into the fact that under some conditions, low lung volumes, vascular resistance increases at the bottom of the lung because of the extra alveolar vessels getting smaller at low lung volumes, uh, but that's, uh, that's something that I don't think it's necessary to concentrate on. We finally looked at uh, active control of the pulmonary circulation, particularly hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which is useful in clinical situations because it reduces blood flow to poorly ventilated areas, but I believe the main evolutionary pressure is in the perinatal period where the blood flow of the fetal lung, which is very small, has to rapidly increase at birth. And finally, we look briefly at the metabolic functions of the lung, uh, its role in biolog biological activation, inactivation, uh, secretion, and so on. And so thank you for being with me on this interesting topic.